I'm the kind of guy that if, when I get uh, a copy of a movie I really like, I look for the one that's got all the special features. I love to know the backstory, the history of the film. I want to know what motivated the producer, director, and writers to make it. What was going on in George Lucas's head when he made Star Wars? Or Steven Spielberg when he made E.T.? I love to know that stuff. It's the same for me with music. What was Mozart thinking when he wrote his Requiem Mass? What was his motivation? Why did he write it? How did he write it? And when? I'll sit with the CD booklet and, and read the comments by the artists of why they wrote the songs, what the circumstances were when they wrote them. I love that history. And you'll have any number of educated experts look at Beethoven's symphonies, for instance, and they can tell you all about the structure, the compositional techniques, and they'll even venture into what was going on in Beethoven's life, the political scene of the day, and so on, and try to figure out what he was thinking when he wrote them. And all of that stuff might be right but it may have no bearing whatsoever on his motivation in composing those great works. You can't tell everything from the works themselves. If you really want the truth, the full story, if you want to get to the heart of what the composer was thinking, don't ask a music critic. Ask the artist. Hey, Neil Diamond, why did you write Sweet Caroline? What was your motivation? What were the circumstances? What was your purpose in writing that song that's been so popular over the years? If you want to know the truth, you have to go to the source. If you want to know all the nitty-gritty details, the why and when and how of a created work, you have to ask the creator. You need to hear the history from the one who knows it best. That's what we have in Genesis. It's the history our triune God has given us. The creator of all that is tells us the what and how and when of his creation. And sure, you'll have all kinds of educated experts trying to look at the work and figure out how it got there. They'll study the composition, the form, and any number of material properties, and based on that information, they believe they know how it all happened. And some of what they say might be right. But I guarantee you, much of it is wrong. How do I know? because it contradicts what the artist says about his own work. Now, we should take a few minutes and address the obvious question. Why should we take the Bible's word for it? Well, there are quite a lot of reasons why we should do this, actually. There are three different categories of evidence for the veracity of Scripture. Let's look at them briefly. We'll start with what we might call the internal evidence, evidence within Scripture itself. I only have time to mention a couple of instances, and, and then only in a cursory manner. First of all, the coherency. Humanly speaking, the Bible was written by 35 different authors over a span of 4,000 years. And absolutely every bit of it is in perfect agreement with itself. Do you know how improbable that is? We don't even have that kind of coherency with the writings of Shakespeare. And that's one author writing 400 years ago. And while you may hear people complain about the contradictions in the Bible, when you ask them what those are, every one of them is based on a misunderstanding of a particular text and usually involves a lack of knowledge regarding Scripture as a whole. A proper understanding of the Bible demonstrates that it is 
utterly coherent in all its parts. Secondly, prophecy. The evidence from fulfilled prophecy is simply staggering. Two examples. The prophecies concerning the birth of Jesus and those concerning his death. The prophecies in Isaiah about Jesus' birth are just too accurate to ignore. Written 700-some years beforehand, they predict where he would be born, to whom he would be born, and the extremely unusual circumstances regarding his birth. And Psalm 22, written 1,200 years before the fact, accurately foretells the circumstances of Jesus' death in such detail that it looks like someone wrote them into the psalm after they happened, which, of course, is impossible because the texts of Isaiah and the psalms were already well established before these events took place. As for what we might call external evidence of the truth of Scripture, there are many outside sources, non-biblical sources, that confirm much of what is recorded in the Bible. There are many Greek and Roman historians who confirm the events of the Old Testament. Josephus, Tacitus, Suetonius, and others corroborate many of the key events in the New Testament, particularly the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Finally, there's what I would call the spiritual evidence of the Bible's trustworthiness. And this is the one that matters the most. If you're a believer in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, and he confirms within you the truth of God's word. Let's face it, unbelievers won't believe the truth of Scripture regardless of how much evidence you pile up in front of them. This is not to denigrate apologetics, by the way. St. Paul encourages us to be ready always to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. But it's the work of the Holy Spirit that causes God's truth to resonate within. Taken together, then, the internal, external, and spiritual evidence leave no doubt as to the reliability of the Genesis account of the history of the beginning. Now, we happily acknowledge the key role that faith plays in our understanding of the origin of all things. The same cannot be said, however, for those who espouse an evolutionist view of origins, though their view requires at least as much faith as ours, probably more. The truth is, there's not one scrap of evidence to show a molecule's demand pattern of evolution is theorized by Darwin and promoted nowadays as established fact, not one. In fact, there's not a scrap of evidence that any created kind has ever evolved into a different created kind. Darwin's classic proof of evolution is the Galapagos finches, whose beaks change in size and shape from one generation to the next. Do you know what you call a bird whose beak adapts to the climatory changes in its environment? A bird? Not only do these creatures not evolve into something other than a bird, they're still finches. They haven't even become a different species of bird. And not every scientist agrees with the mainstream. There are plenty of good, respectable, recognized in their field scientists who are creationists. One of the problems with evolutionism is that it's not even good science. For one thing, it violates its own principles. The scientific method states that in order for something to be considered a fact of nature, it must be subjected to scientific testing. This testing must be observable, repeatable, and disprovable, which means that you, you, you make a prediction based on your observation, and then you subject that prediction to further testing. Now, let me ask you, can you test whether or not the universe started with the Big Bang. Were you there to observe it? Can it be repeated? 
How can you engage the scientific method with something that can't be observed, repeated, or tested? You can't. Anything you come up with then is not science. It's philosophy. When mainstream science makes claims about the origin of the universe, that's not good science. They've stepped out of the realm of science and have entered the realm of philosophy. I could go on, but we need to keep moving. Here's the real problem. Children have been taught in the public education system that the Bible's account of origins is faith-based and therefore unreliable, while mainstream science's account is true because it's based on science, which it isn't. It's every bit as much based on faith as creationism. Now, it's not surprising when the world teaches something contrary to the church. This has forever been so. And when the attacks come from outside the church, we can point to Scripture and say, here's what the Bible says. We believe this. Let the world believe what it wants. The trouble is, now we have leaders within the church community who are saying that we need to compromise the teaching of Genesis with the teaching of the world. This is known as theistic evolution, and it basically claims that God used evolution as a method of creation. But we have a problem. There are some really glaring discrepancies between evolutionism and creationism that can't be easily resolved. For example, the Bible says that God created the universe by the breath of his mouth, which means he spoke things into existence. Theistic evolutionists say that he used evolution as a method of creation. That's a problem. Evolutionists say that it took billions of years for the universe to develop. The Bible says that, it, that, that God took six days to create everything. That's a discrepancy and a pretty big one. Evolutionists say that there was a particular order of how things developed. The Bible has a completely different order. Don't you think that's a problem? So now we have a number of different theories being employed by theistic evolutionists to try to deal with these discrepancies. There's the gap theory that says that there's an unmentioned space of time, perhaps billions of years, between the initial creation in Genesis 1 verse 1 and God's eventual reordering of creation from Genesis 1 verse 2 onward. There's the day-age theory that says that the days mentioned in Genesis 1 are not normal 24-hour days. There are other theories that would take too much time to discuss, you know, probably millions of years. And there are so many problems with the two that I've mentioned that I can't even begin to unpack them all. Suffice it to say that when the Bible says day, in any instance, that uses a number, it always, always, always refers to a normal 24-hour period. And as for the gap theory, it's in that gap that supposedly the dinosaurs lived and died and killed each other and so on and so on. How can God look at all those millions of years of death and destruction and call it good? Verse 31 of our text says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. How could it be very good if in the middle of it all there was death and destruction? And here's where the problem really comes home to roost. What do you think it does in the mind of a child who already has enough to deal with sorting out what he learns at school and what he learns at church. Well, now the church is teaching him, well, don't believe what it says in Genesis, but believe in Jesus. Why? Listen, if the history of the beginning is false, why should we believe the rest of the history? And we wonder why our children are leaving the church and never coming back. 
Beloved, if the Bible's teaching about Christ is true, then it's all true, including Genesis. If we're going to believe the Bible, let's believe it from the very first verse. Let's be consistent and not allow the flawed theories of mere humans to confuse and contradict the clear word of God. At the beginning of time, God spoke all things into existence by the power of his word, just as he said he did. In the course of time, he sent his son, born of a woman, born of a virgin, who carried our sins to a cross outside Jerusalem, who died there in payment for those sins, rose from the dead on the third day, ascended into heaven, where he rules all things for the sake of his church who's coming again in glory to receive us unto himself. The events recorded in the Bible were all real historical events recorded for us in the pages of Scripture under the directing hand of God. That's the teaching of Scripture. That's what we believe and confess. Let's not muddle it by mixing it with the flawed opinions of men. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.